And we are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. Uh, many people in the United States, including a lot of people who were supporters of the Democratic Party, don't question the foreign policy assumptions that have guided this country in its military endeavors for at least 75 years, and in truth, for far longer than that. Many of those people have discovered uh, during the events of January 6 on uh, Capitol Hill that the very possibility, however remote, that their own government might be changed by force was an experience they found to be rather unpleasant. And it seemed to me that this made it the ideal time to explore the issue of other countries who have found their governments, in fact, violently overthrown, not just a one, a one day process, but uh, a lifetime in many cases of violent intervention driven by this country. And therefore it becomes, uh, in my mind, a perfect time to speak with my next guest. Vijay Prasad, among other things, is a working journalist. He is, uh, I believe the director is certainly uh, uh, one of the uh, leading figures in the Tricontinental Institute. And is he is the author of a number of books, the latest of which is going to be the primary subject of our conversation, Washington Bullets. You can see it on my uh, a tablet there. No, you can't actually. So, but Washington Bullets, is, is, his latest is an exploration of, as the title might suggest, um, the uh, effect of Washington military force on other countries. And without any further ado, uh, Vijay Prashad, I want to welcome you to the program. Thanks a lot, Richard. It's great that you're paying attention to this book. Thanks a lot. Well, I think it's very, very important. And uh, my initial impression was A, that it was an important topic, and B, as I'm sure other uh, interviewers have pointed out, it means you're a, a fan of The Clash because <laughs> the, late in their career, relatively speaking, they had a song called Washington Bullets, which I assume was the inspiration for your title? Without a doubt. Um, it's, uh, it's a song from the album Sandinista. Right. And um, it uh, is about the Nicaraguan revolution, really. And it's about interventions. So it was just perfect. In fact, from, I think, the 1980s, I've wanted to do something again with that title because it's so perfect. It really is. And um, uh, I haven't heard it in years, but as I recall, the chorus goes Washington Bullets again which seems to me to be even more germane to your topic, which is this endless, seemingly endless, this more than century long process of United States military intervention in other countries. And now as we see a new administration coming in in the United States, I am among the many, many Americans who are delighted to see Donald Trump go, but we're seeing a uh, 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 changing of the guard uh, and purely the ceremonial sense. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of the old guard of the national security establishment in this country coming back to positions of power. I mean, Victoria Nuland and, and, uh, and some of the others. So especially when it comes to foreign policy and military policy, mm -hmm. I think it's more important than ever that uh, not just Americans, but specifically people who might identify as Democrats, liberals, Biden supporters get a deeper understanding of uh, what their country has done and continues to do elsewhere. And I'll just add before we go into our conversation that I liked the title, I liked the topic. I did not expect to learn as much mm -hmm. as I did. I considered myself reasonably versed in, in these issues, but your book is extremely informative including a lot of things, a lot of history that I didn't know. So uh, I encourage people to read it. Um, let me start with this, if I may. Uh, over all these years, including the years where you've had that title uh, floating in your head, what uh, inspired you to write this now as opposed to at some other point? I mean, this is almost a perennial topic, right? So uh, what was it that led you to write this book at this time or at the time that you began the process? Well, first, thanks a lot for such kind 
words about the book. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, writers write in semi-isolation and it's really wonderful when somebody reads what they've written and says, well, you know, it wasn't really a waste of time. Um, <laughs> in a way, Richard, there were two um, origin stories of, a, of this book in particular. One is slightly longer. One is very, very compressed. I'll give you the longer one first. Longer in time, not in the length of my okay. telling. Um, <laughs> Over the course, no, no. Over the course of the past maybe decade or so, I've been trying to find out who killed a U.S. ambassador in Kabul, and mm -hmm. I've traveled around the world. And I'm not going to tell you much about that story because I'm still on it, and it's mm -hmm. unclear. In the course of um, finding out how this ambassador was killed, his name was Adolf Dubs, as it turns out. Uh, I met a number of CIA agents who were in either Afghanistan or in the directorate of operations for that region, including the late Chuck Kogan. I spent a lot of time with Chuck interviewing him. Chuck uh, consistently told me, stay away from this topic. You'll get hurt if you try to find out about uh -huh. it, which of course made me want to study it more. And right. over the and Chuck was also the CIA um, station chief in Paris at a very important time. And, you know, over the years, talking to these CIA men, uh, all men uh, of a certain generation who uh, operated either in Latin America or in the Middle East, um, I built up a, a reservoir of um, understanding about the really deep uh, involvement of the CIA in these countries. And, you know, of course, now the CIA is relatively unimportant compared to the NSA, the National Security Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency and so on. But nonetheless, it's still a big actor. And I know we have a lot of books about the CIA and, you know, it's, it's all there in the public record. But what they were telling me was much more chilling than anything I'd read. And I just, you know, like Chuck would just tell me about assassinations in a very you know, brusque way, like it's mm -hmm. just something that they did. And I asked him many times, you know, but somebody was killed and and they have family and, and they were just trying to make the world a better place. What gave you the right to authorize the killing? And he was like, well, it was against what we understood to be U.S. interests. That's the long answer. The short answer is I was heart sick, Richard, when there was a coup d'etat against the government of Evo Morales in November mm -hmm. of 2019. And I felt that um, the mass, the party in power, the people of Bolivia were really undone at that moment by what was uh, pushed upon them, imposed on them. Because in that case, the United States government's allied with a literal inheritor of Bolivia's Nazi inheritance. You know, people may not know that when the Nazis fled Europe, many of them showed up in South America. And one of them, Klaus Barbie, very famous Nazi, trained the intelligence services of the military in Bolivia and was, in fact, a, a high official in the Bolivian dictatorship. Uh, well, in parts of Bolivia, these groups of these people, the Camachos and others, come out of that Nazi movement in Bolivia. And it's with them that the United States allied to overthrow the government of Morales. After that coup, I was so amazed that New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, all of them just came out and said, well, it wasn't a coup, it was a popular uprising. And I thought, seriously? I mean, listen, there's a long history of this, and this is textbook, which is why the middle section of my book is a manual of regime change. And the reason I did, did it that way is to say, look, just take a look at the script. Um, the evidence from that I've used is from Guatemala, but it could have been from Iran. It could have been from Bolivia 2019. It's a script, you know, and it hasn't changed over at least, as you say, 100 years, but at least 60 years after World War II. So that was the immediate motivation for the book. I wanted a generation to understand that there is this script and the people of the United States need to recognize that this must not be done in their name. It's done in the shadows, but it's nonetheless done in their name. And it should not be because people are sensitive and they should stand up and say, I, I refuse. And, you know, I, I do think that many people would refuse if, uh, if they understood this. Uh, a little, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not naive about the idealism of of Americans or anyone else, but I do think that a lot of people don't know exactly what's being done in their name. And I'm speaking specifically of Americans. And uh, the issue that you bring up here is the complicity 
of the US press in this process, among other things, which to me is so naked and so clear. You, you mentioned Evo Morales, uh, uh, democratically elected leader of Bolivia, a first indigenous president of that country, wrote the introduction to your book. Um, uh, it, since then, and that was not so long ago, we've seen uh, the U.S. involvement in Venezuela, for example. And, and the same thing, the extreme distortion of, the, of what Americans read in their supposedly liberal press in the Washington Post and the in the New York Times and so on. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I think that's part of what makes the book important. But I also think it's one of the reasons why I'm gonna guess that it has not been reviewed in the New York Times book review, for example. I may be wrong, but uh, my guess, or if it has by any chance, perhaps unfavorably. But uh, I, I think the typical, uh, response is to shut out this kind of news. And now with social media and so on, digital media to discredit or downplay the people who report these stories. Uh, so all the more reason for those of us in this country to understand. I'll, I'll give you one thing that was really, which I knew, but was put in context well in your book that I, I wish more people understood. Uh, Americans have met, those who read the New York Times every day, for example, and consider themselves liberal and open-minded and progressive, have probably read dozens of times that there was a movement to sanction the invasion of country XYZ and to overthrow its government, but that, uh, move, that move was, or that vote was overruled by the UN Security Council. They've probably read that dozens of times, if they uh, try to stay well informed without understanding the context of what that means. Uh, and if, if you don't mind just briefly explaining that, what you explain in the book, uh, rather than me attempting, uh, I mean, I think that would be a good case in point. Well, let's first think about the media and come to that. Um, sure. Because I think the question of the media or the shapers of public opinion, it's, very, it's a very important issue. You know, um, the United States government was e eager to go to war against Iraq in 2002 and tried to build up a case in the United Nations. Um, there was an instance, and we got this from Colonel Larry Wilkerson, who was the aide-de-camp or chief of staff of Colin Powell, who was then uh, the U.S. Secretary of State in the government of George W. Bush. Now, Colin Powell felt that the evidence that the CIA had amassed to show that Saddam Hussein's government had weapons of mass destruction, the evidence was weak and he was not comfortable with the evidence. Now, what I, I don't have a brief with Colin Powell. This is not a personality issue. The fact right. is Wilkerson said he was uncomfortable with the evidence. Um, he was to go make a presentation before the UN Security Council. And just before the presentation, Wilkerson described, just before he went out at the horseshoe table in New York City, um, he was slipped a brief that said, this is uh, evidence from a, a, from a person called Curveball. <laughs> this is somebody who uh, had been tortured in Egypt and had given some information. He didn't know that the person was in jail in Egypt had been tortured, physically tortured, not just psychological torture, and had said that there is this evidence of a meeting in Czechoslovakia, and it was all concocted. So uh, the CIA director sat right behind Colin Powell in the briefing, and I, I asked people to go and watch the video of this. So Colin Powell presents this evidence and holds up a vial, and it's really appalling. And, and you can see he's uncomfortable. Well, the countries of the world don't buy it. They don't accept the U.S. argument even then, even though Colin Powell, a man with some credibility among the people sitting around the horseshoe table, Colin Powell presents this evidence. The New York Times, meanwhile, has been running story after story at the time written by Judy Miller um, on the so-called science of terror in Iraq. So there's a kind of churning of music, background music from the New York Times, priming the public to believe that Saddam Hussein's government had weapons of mass destruction, which they did not have. So she was writing story after story, all leaked to her from the CIA, from the defense intelligence people, from the military, from, this, from people like that, all leaked. And we find this out later. 
New York Times editors didn't seem to ask for sourcing. I find this interesting. I work for a syndication service called Globe Trotter. Every time I file a story, my editor is superb. She goes through every fact. If I say it's from this document, she checks. This is the old school. She checks to see if the quotation is correct. She asks me, we don't really allow anonymous quotations, except if I'm talking to an intelligence person, then I have to find a way to tell them, look, I'm not actually believing what the intelligence person is telling me. I'm just reporting that they said so. Judy Miller never did that. She actually said, this is what's happening. She didn't say intelligence agencies gave me this dossier and I'm sharing this with you. Because that's a different kind of reporting, right? If intelligence gives me a dossier, I would write and say, I was given a dossier by the intelligence and here's what the, the, the dossier says, but I don't can't verify it. Now, they may not use you again, but at least you're credible as a reporter. You know, that should be meaningful to somebody, your credibility. So while that's happening outside, the New York Times is producing this noise, this music saying, let's go to war because Colin Powell lies willingly or unwillingly. This is up to Wilkerson. I don't know. Willingly or unwillingly. At any rate, he says a falsehood in the Security Council. He says there is, you know, this. Now, the interesting thing is at that point, nobody believes the United States. There is no vote to sanction an attack under chapter seven of the UN charter. And yet the United States government goes to war. At that time, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2003 doesn't say anything in public. This is to his discredit. I mean, he knows this, this is wrong. He doesn't say anything. He waits till 2004 to talk to BBC during an interview with BBC where Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General, says that the war in Iraq is illegal. The US was, he uses the word illegal. He didn't say anything beforehand. He never said it immediately, he waited. Meanwhile, I don't know how many Iraqis had been killed. The country was already on the way to being destroyed. That episode shows you both that the US media has levels of complicity that are shocking and shameful. And the New York Times has never really apologized for it. You know, there was a reporter who made up stories uh, about some coverage in, in, I think, in somewhere or the other. I've forgotten the exact details, Richard, but he made up some stories, domestic stories. He was brought up. He was fired. The New York Times ran a huge investigation in their pages about his reporting. He was an African-American reporter. I don't remember his name. There was never a real inquiry about Judy Miller's reporting. There was no right. mea culpa in the pages. Nothing. Right. That You're was thinking gone. of Jason, perhaps of Jason Blair. Jason uh, Blair. Yeah. The... No, it, it, the, on the other hand, what the U.S. media does, and, and, and we, if you hear percent, we could find ourselves talking about the media uh, ad infinitum, but is they grant this sort of cheap ad solution to these figures retrospectively. A, a classic case is the, all the articles that said uh, uh, Colin Powell sincerely believed the intelligence he was given and was very upset when he found out uh, that he was misinformed. Now, if I found a, a glaring factual error in your book, DJ, and I said, this is untrue and harmful, and you said to me, I didn't know that. I'm very upset to learn that. As a good journalist, what I would say is, is the author told me he did not know. I would not describe your state of mind because I'm not a mind reader. So I would not have a headline that said, author upset that he has been deceived. I don't know if you were deceived. I don't know if you're upset. I only know what you tell me. That's journalism 101, which uh, our colleagues don't tend to practice. And I feel that's their responsibility. The part of the citizenry of the United States, myself included, is uh, none of us should be too quick to accept this. We should know by now uh, that we are habitually misinformed. None of us should uh, find, uh, accept the explanation that allows us to have an easy conscience. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, I could go on, but uh, basically, and none of us should accept the feel good conclusion. George W. Bush, in my view, for example, clearly a war criminal of the worst order but he gives Michelle Obama a piece of candy at some public event and all the Democrats now he has a better approval rating than uh, than a lot of other Democrats. So, you know, 
it's a feel good. The feel good ending is is something we should avoid as well. Um, let me ask you this though, to get back to the bu book for a second, what kind of reception has it received, if not in the US mainstream media, in other media and in other parts of the world? Well, you know, I, I, I've written about 30 books and um, I'm not, I, I would not expect, I would be shocked if um, any main corporate publication paid attention to any of them, frankly, I would be shocked. Uh, this book is going to be out in about 20 languages. It's done very well in South America. You'd expect it to have. In Brazil, it's it sold out the first run. It's on a second run. Um, in India, it's done very well. You know, in many parts of the world, it's doing very well. Um, the book has been reviewed favorably in those parts of the world, uh, the parts of the world where people understand what it means to live in a cool atmosphere. I think you put it very well when you said on the 6th of January, people in the United States began to feel the neurological sensation mm -hmm. of having your government overthrown. There is a kind of neurological crisis that occurs. It's not just political. It affects your nerves. I mean, you start to tremble with the feeling that, well, with violence, our government can be overthrown. People who've lived with this, you know, from one end of the world to the other, who have this experience, uh, they are much more ready to accept the story and to fill in the details. You know, for instance, there are some things that are not known to people, such as a U.S. military involvement in Thailand is totally unknown to most people. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because a lot of the CIA internal discussion was around the intervention in Thailand in the 1960s. Uh, you know, Thailand is currently ruled by a military dictatorship. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if people know that there was a coup there um, about uh, now seven years ago. Um, and it's in stasis. You know, the monarchy actually doesn't govern. The military governs Thailand. The monarchy is the public face of the military. And then there's a ruling elite which works in cahoots with Washington, D.C. That's the basic elegance of the Thai solution. And guess what? That Thai solution, that was what the United States engineered in South America for a decade, you know, th that, that's what happened in the juntas of Argentina, of Brazil, of, um, you know, of, of Chile and so on. I mean, this is a formula and it's, a, it's an ugly formula. So, I, I mean, why would, why would somebody in a corporate house in the, you know, countries like the United States take this kind of thing seriously? They think this is probably the rant of a conspiracy theorist. Um, you know, and not a journalist. I mean, I go into this idea of conspiracy theory in the book. Um, this is actually something that was discussed inside the CIA. How do we make criticism into a conspiracy theory? How do we go out there in an information war and when somebody comes close to the truth, we just associate them with, you know, nutcases who say that there's a place in Roswell um, where aliens land and so on. So if I write a book criticizing a coup d'etat uh, against a government, let's say in, in Bolivia, then I am just like somebody who says that 9-11 was an inside job. There are aliens who come routinely and probe people. You know, this, that, that Kennedy was killed by, you know, I don't know, the mafia, which may actually be true. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't I mean, either. any of these could be true. We just don't know. But you see, they've already delegitimized certain people, the tinfoil hat people, and they say any criticism should be colored as part of the camp of the tinfoil hat. And I'm not prepared to allow myself to be in the camp of the tinfoil hat by their definition. Because in my opinion, and that's the reason for this book, it's largely based on CIA sources, both their own records that are in the public domain and interviews with CIA agents. I very rarely use anything other than the CIA's own material to talk about the CIA. Very rarely do I go outside this record. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to say, really, this is a conspiracy theory, but it's your own materials. I, I'm not saying it. You in your own materials said the following. You said that we want to make sure that nobody can see our involvement in what we are doing in Guyana. You wrote that in your own documents. You said, we have to figure out how to pretend that what's happening in Guyana is exactly to do with Guyana, nothing to do with us. I didn't say that. You are saying cover up our tracks. And all I'm doing is showing, look, that's part of your regime change manual. You say, when we overthrow a government, cover your tracks. 
30, 40 years later, we can admit it. Yes, we did overthrow the government of Jacob Barbens in, in, in Guatemala. Yes, we did do that. But, you know, that was years ago. We don't do that kind of thing now. It's very clever information war, by the way. Very clever. And scores of scores of liberal journalists who want to believe the best of their country. And who blames them for that? Just forgive and forgive and forgive and then end up because they believe in this exceptionalist idea. Look at Mr. Obama's most recent book. It's called Promised Land. Why is the United States a promised land? Why is it exceptional? They believe that it's good and it only does good. And there's one or two bad apples, Trump, but not the Dulles brothers. I mean, you've got an airport in Washington, D.C. named after the Dulleses. The Dulles brothers personally gained from the coup d'etat in Guatemala. If there was really international law, they should have been brought to book somewhere. They personally gained. And in the book, I detail the personal pecuniary interest that members of the uh, government of the United States, this is Dwight Eisenhower's government, members of the Eisenhower government, they personally gained from the overthrow of Jacob Arbenz because they were stakeholders in United Fruit Company. And senior stakeholders, they were either high lawyers, they had shares, and so on. And yet you continue to name an airport in Washington, D.C. after the Dulles brothers. I mean, what does that make somebody from Guatemala think? Well, of course. And, uh, and again, we're talking with uh, author Vijay Pras Prashad about his new book, Washington Bullets. And of the many thoughts I had uh, while you were talking, Vijay, I remember in reading about the formation of the Warren Commission in this country to investigate the murder of John F. Kennedy, one of the people involved said, you know, we have to clear this up because there are rumors to this day that the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a conspiracy. Now, two thoughts about that. Number one, in other words, and I don't want to get into the whole JFK assassination thing, except to say, number one, the commission was formed to disprove the idea that it was a conspiracy. And number two, perhaps more importantly, the Lincoln assassination was a conspiracy. There were multiple players involved and they went after senior members of his cabinet as well. So I guess my ultimate point being conspiracies aren't always paranoid delusions. There are conspiracies, there are plots, there are secret plans, but we have a press corps that on one hand, cries out to the uh, to the uh, technological monoliths, the Facebooks and Twitters and so on, to censor anyone who uh, is a, uh, of any kind who varies from the accepted narrative, number one. And number two, uh, what, what, which can include you, me, uh, some of my regular guests, Max Blumenthal and so on. A lot of people have been affected by this. Um, but number two, uh, have no compunction about saying that January 6th violence was a conspiracy to overthrow the United States government. So there are there are FDA approved, that's a sort of inside American joke, but there are certified conspiracies you could talk about. There are others you can't discuss. So I strongly encourage people to, uh, you know, first of all, to read your book. And um, while I have you, I, I mean, there's much in here I'd love to talk about, including the idea of divine right, the history of the idea of divine right and people pushing back at it, and the history and the notion that uh, colonialism is more efficient and better than letting these unruly neighbors rule themselves, which among other things made me think of a lot of the economic analysis that was done of the enclosure movement in uh, the British Isles. They said, well, productivity went up when the common lands were taken from the people. Well, maybe that's not the only thing you should worry about, but but it, it struck me there was a, 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 a sort of synchronicity there. Uh, but I do want to talk before I let you go about the farmer's strike in India, because I know uh, you've published about it, Tricontinental, other writers have published about it. It's something we've covered in the past on this program. Uh, there was a general strike. Who knows how many people were uh, involved, but perhaps 100 million, something like that. A very large number in that event. Uh, the agricultural economy in uh, India 
what, probably 750 million people, three quarters of a billion people live in an agricultural setting. So it's hugely important to a massive number of people. And there were recently events that I think in a sense got the kind of the same media treatment that you and I have been talking about uh, in the countries the United States has intervened. And is that fair? Is that accurate? Well, um, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And um, the Indian government, in the middle of a pandemic, pushed two labor bills and three agriculture bills. The labor bills essentially invalidate the eight-hour day. They will allow concerns to have people for 12 hours, you know, no overtime, just work them to death. That was the attack on working class, on service sector, and so on. The three agricultural bills basically destroyed the ability of any farmer, not only small farmer, but even quite large farmers to bargain against big corporate um, you know, houses, which will buy their goods in the market. So no price support, uh, no uh, regulation of the marketplace where farmers will sell their produce, the so-called mandi. Uh, this was pushed through parliament last year. It came to the upper house of parliament. The government wouldn't allow a discussion, just did a voice vote. You know, they rammed it through with their majority. It's a very undemocratic thing to do in a parliamentary system. So they pushed all these through. On the um, 26th of November, the trade unions, 10 trade union federations, and a whole bunch of farmer organizations called a general strike. And we estimate 250 million people went on strike. That's the largest strike in world history. Uh, there's been no bigger strike than that. 250 million people on strike one day. On the 26th of November, that exact day, farmers that lived around the city of New Delhi came on their tractors and buses and walked up to the gates of Delhi. The government barricaded the city and blocked them. There was a lot of violence. The police just attacked the farmers who came peacefully. Um, but farmers, even the big farmers came, which is why you had tractors, and they pulled the barricades aside and there was a clash. From 26th of November till 26th of January, it was stasis around Delhi. The farmers just sat there around the city and there was farmers rebellion around the country. On the 26th of January, which is India's Republic Day, the day that our constitution came into effect in 1950, the farmers entered the city and there was a major clash and they came to Red Fort, which is a very important political place and they uh, amassed there and had speeches and so on. They've rejected the government's proposals because the government is negotiating from a standpoint which is untenable. They are saying essentially, no price support, now negotiate with us. And the farmers are saying, no, let's go back to price support and then let's have a conversation. Because you see, no price support is going to wipe out farming in India and just have the big corporates come and monopolize everything. So this is a life and death existential issue for the farmers. What we're going to have to see, Richard, I mean, this is very militant and it's not going anywhere. But what we're going to have to see is whether this social and political development has an electoral impact against mm -hmm. the current government. The problem with democracy in the world today is it's a hollowed out institution. Elections are basically bought and sold. I mean, enormous amounts of money. The last Indian parliamentary election was the most expensive in the world. More expensive than the election that first brought in Donald Trump, which was very, a lot of money was spent on that. 90% of the money in India goes to the ruling party, the right-wing party. 90% of the money, hmm. you know, that's documented. That means undocumented money even more to them. And so they win elections with money power and with media power. Whether this struggle, which has already created a social rift and political dividends for the opposition, it's not clear whether it will create electoral dividends. I don't know if the opposition will benefit at the ballot box. Certainly in two states in India, in Punjab and Haryana, the ruling BJP party, the right wing, is going to lose its allies. That's probably the case. But they can still win the country. And this is disturbing. It shows you what's being done to democracy. Look at Brazil. The pandemic is out of control. There's the, in the uh, city of Manaus, they ran out of oxygen. People were dying in the hospital. And yet the opinion rating of Jair Bolsonaro has gone up. He's totally failed to handle the pandemic and his opinion rating has gone up. Why? Immense money power, immense media power. Our democratic institutions have really been hollowed out. And it's really something to consider, you know, take...
quite seriously we have democracy we have democracy we have the the instruments of democracy but whether we have the spirit and the ability to exercise the democratic process that's an entirely different question and so you know i would caution people there's an election in ecuador on the 7th of february where the people's candidate andres arauz is polling now above 40% which means he should win in the first round it's not clear on 7th february whether they will allow him to win 40% right. you know so people need to be very aware that all kinds of tricks are used in brazil they brought a case against lula didn't allow him to win he would have won against bolsonaro in the first round right. um, you know this is what is called lawfare this is all hollowing out democracy worry about it people it's not that you have too little to worry about but worry about this as well <laughs> no i i couldn't agree more and by the way i think the us media is doing the same thing to the farmers strike that it's doing it has done elsewhere including bolivia uh, let me just if i may just read you and if if you don't have blood pressure problems uh, how the new the new york times pu- kindly published an explainer uh telling its readers Uh, here's what's really going on in, in India but it, to me it's a great case study it says government support for farmers uh helped india move past the hunger crisis of the 1960s but with india liberalizing its economy in recent thick thick decades note the use of the word liberalizing which to new york times readers must be a good thing uh not deregulating not taking away protections or whatever mr modi who wants the country's economy to nearly double by 2024 what a noble man he must be to want that sees su- such a large role for the government as no longer sustainable in other words entirely making modi's case for him in the guy and using slanted language goes on to say farmers however contend they are struggling even with the existing protections they say that market friendly laws note that other term market friendly the markets are good and what's wrong with being friendly i mean the psychological warfare being played on the american reader here will eventually leave them bereft uh so they can claim they've told both sides but there's a sort of subtle mind control at the same time that i suspect that india is in much the same position as the united states electorally which is say a year ago which is you have a an openly corrupt what well, i would say extremist and uh you know racially biased anti muslim government and so on while at the same time the farmer strike is going on but there's no party speaking for the farmers just as in the US there's no party speaking for the workers of this country openly i mean maybe the democrats have better policies here and there but nobody's saying in the teacher strikes of 2017 in the united states we're unconditionally with the teachers nobody is saying uh, you know unions now yeah, so is that let, a fair let me let me put let me put some facts to you richard just okay. uh, just put some facts to you because i was very curious the new york times story that you read out interested me but let me give you some uh, let me now narrate the story of the united states over the I've, i've been looking at this over the last 20 years the us government has spent 1.7 trillion dollars on farm subsidies over the last 20 years in 2019 the us government upped the amount that it paid in farm subsidies to 22 billion the highest it's been in 14 years so editor new york times while you are saying that in india the government should not have a big role and they should liberalize the economy and so on the government in the united states has increased farm subsidies to the tune of 22 billion in 2019 when the farmers started this agitation Right. over the last 20 years they've spent 1.7 trillion dollars so in the united states it's acceptable for the us government to have a big role in the farming sector but in india it's unacceptable so this is what i consider to be the pure hypocrisy of the media you know whoever wrote that story has not an ounce of self respect because the newspaper that's published from the united states has seen an increase in farm subsidy payments by the government and yet they will preach to india i mean that is you don't have when i listen to something like that i think i can't respect you i just can't respect you 
from which ground are you making your claim? Is it from economic theory or is it from hypocrisy? Strikes me you are speaking from the continent of hypocrisy. And I would like to have seen in that story just a parenthetical note that said, incidentally, the United States government has increased farm subsidies in this period. That would have put the story in context. Which doesn't sound very market friendly to me. Uh, and yet the same politicians pushing those subsidies, uh, if you tell them, well, American workers need some sort of financial assistance to get them through this crisis, oh, that sounds like socialism to me. So unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But the book, again, is Washington Bullets. My guest is Vijay Prashad. That's V-I-J-A-Y. P-R-S-H-A-D, and I'm Richard Eskow, E-S-K-O-W. This is uh, the Zero Hour. We'll be back after this. And, and Vijay Prashad, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks.